So the title of uh, my presentation is Collective Intentionality, <coughs> Rationality and Institutional Reality. I will start my presentation with a difference that Searle doesn't make, but which from my point of view best captures his understanding of collective, collective intentionality. That is, I will make the difference between what I call C collective intentionality and A collective intentionality. Of course, these terms are mine. Take example of football, football game. We could say that the aim of each team is to win the game, and that players within the team cooperate in order to reach that aim. For this kind of cooperation, we say that it has the characteristic of C collective intentionality. But in order to have a game of football, we also need some rules that are collectively accepted. Both teams have to respect the rules in order to play a game of football. For this kind of collective acceptance, we will use the term A collective intentionality. This term might be misleading in a sense that C collective intentionality is not. Namely, the letter C clearly stands for cooperation. But we, if we understand A collective intentionality to mean acceptance of certain social institutions, then we might have a case where people go along with the rules of certain institution without any endorsement of those rules. After this kind of criticism, instead of just talking about the acceptance, Searle started to use the phrase acceptance or recognition. So when I'm using the term A collective intentionality, actually what I mean by that is uh, acceptance or recognition. Uh, this conception of C collective intentionality can further be elaborated in the following way. I will state it as the C collective intentionality thesis. And it reads as follows. Something is a social cooperation between A and, a and B if and only if A and B have collective intentionality. Uh, we should note two things here. First, of course, A and B, uh, th these three variables that they use might be persons, but so also thinks that different kinds of animals have collective intentionality. Whenever two or more animals cooperate, for example, a pack of wolves hunting together or birds building their nest, they exhibit collective intentionality according to Sir. We'll come back to this naturalistic interpretation of collective intentionality later. It is also worth noting that the reference to just two cooperators is made for simplicity. Since I'm going to argue against the C collective intentionality thesis, that the argument will not be affected if we extend it in such a way to include N cooperators. Now, the A, the A collective intentionality thesis reads as follows. Some X is social institution if and only if X is collectively accepted or recognized. To motivate this difference a little bit further, I will uh, quote uh, from Searle's latest book, uh, where he says, uh, in, in this chapter he was first talking about uh, this conception of what, of what I call C-collective uh, intentionality. So far I have been concerned primar primarily to explain the structure of full-blown cooperation as manifested in collective prior intentions and collective intentions in action. However, there is a much weaker form of collective attitudes which will also be important for our analysis of society. And this is what I call collective rec recognition. For example, in an actual transaction when I buy something from somebody and put money in their hands which they accept, we have full-blown cooperation. But in addition to this intentionality, we have prior the transaction and continuing after the tra transaction an attitude towards uh, pieces of paper of the type that I'm placing in the hands of the seller. If we both recognize or accept the pieces of paper as money and indeed we accept the general institution of money as well as the institution of commerce. Uh, as a general point, institutional structures require collective recognition by the participants uh, in the institution in order to function. But particular transactions within the institution require cooperation of the sort that I have been describing, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that is in, on the, at the pages 56 and 57, the book Making the Social World. So in the first part of the presentation, I will argue against the C collective intentionality thesis. Since Sir thinks that uh, C collective intentionality thesis can be given materialistic interpretation, I will introduce the notion of rationality at it, as it is usually defined in evolutionary game theory. After rejecting the C collective intentionality thesis on the, base, uh, on the basis of game uh, 
theoretical considerations, I will argue in the second part of the presentation that the A collective intentionality thesis is inconsistent with Searle's own view of rationality. My point is that Searle didn't provide conclusive re reasons for the claim that by granting the A collective intentionality thesis, the individuals are motivated to act, to act in, in accordance with collective intentionality, which then undermines his conception of how institutions function. Okay, now, first part. Searle presupposes that in addition to intentionality of the type I intend, there is also a second type of intentionality that has the form we intend, which doesn't, by definition, exclude the former. One of the obvious examples would be we have uh, several people pushing their car. So I would say that it is true that each of them has I intention in the form I tend to do a certain thing, for example, to push a car, but it is also true that they all have we intentions in the form we intend, in this case, to push a car. So the suggestion is that in order to have cooperative behavior, there must be a collective intentionality. In order to show that, Cyril, in order to show that, so gives another example. Let's say that there are two musicians who are by accident playing the same melody, simply because they are neighbors and they started to play at the same time, and that there are musicians that play the, same, the very same melody within the orchestra. In the first case, we would be inclined to say that their behavior is simply synchronized, while in the second case, we are inclined to say that it is the example of cooperative behavior. Now, Sir Kern claims that uh, uh, some kind of uh, collective intentionality must be present if we uh, have social cooperation at all. He says, uh, just take the collective intentionality in my head as a primitive. It is of the form we intend, even though, even though it is in my individual head. And if, in fact, I am succeeding in cooperating with you, then what's in your head will also be of the form we intend. And also, another quotation, whenever you have people cooperating, you have collective intentionality. This is the foundation of all social activities. Still, there are two more things that uh, should be explained. For, first, in which sense uh, we take collective intentionality as primitive, and second, why we intend cannot be reduced to I intend. So things that uh, collective intentionality is prim basic or primitive phenomenon in a biological sense, and it cannot be reduced to something else. It cannot be reduced neither to individual intentionality nor on some kind of Hegelian uh, world spirit that could be something more or something beyond the individuals. Evidence that he gives uh, uh, support it, this claim is that, uh, that it is a biological phenomenon, primitive biological phenomenon, is the fact that, as I said, that even animals who are hunting together they have certain form of cooperative behavior. So in the world of animals, we can also find social facts. And by social facts, so uh, mean uh, any fact that includes two or more cooperators that have collective intentionality. So that's very similar. With, uh, and I think that Gilbert also defines social fact in that way. So he, I, I don't remember, I think that he even quote Gilbert uh, at that place. Uh, Searle also thinks that we should reject uh, the assumption of methodological indivi uh, individualism because it reduces collective intentionality or individual intentionality. According to Searle, if you're doing something together with other people, <coughs> then we are doing that in a collective way. That what we are doing cannot be simply reduced to a first-person perspective. I intend is in that case, just a part of our joint or we intention. So uh, also adds that the construction that contains uh, two or more uh, I intend elements and believes that other people also intend and so on is too complicated and it also leads to infinite regress. So uh, it is possible that actors uh, have in their heads intentionality of the form we intend, even when it is formulated in the form of I intend. This we intend, according to Searle, neither exclude nor reduce this I intend form. Okay, now I want to point out that 
Searle's uh, rejection that might come from the perspective of methodological individual individualism is based just on the concept of intentionality. What I want to argue now is that when we're talking about cooperation, we should also bring in the concept of rationality in this perspective. And uh, like I said, Sir claims that his uh, perspective is naturalistic, so I will use uh, actually a concept uh, of rationality like it is commonly used in evolutionary game theory. So, in actually start first with game theory. In game theory, we uh, presuppose that uh, when two uh, people interact, that actually their decisions are somehow interact, uh, 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 interconnected. <coughs> so, when I'm thinking what making a decision and thinking what I'm going to do. My best strategy must include the best strategy of other people who are cooperating. Now, we have different kinds of games. The most famous uh, division is that we have uh, games of pure coordination, we have games of pure conflict, and we have uh, games with mixed motives. I, I'm not going to explain all, all these kinds of games. I, 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 I would suppose that you're familiar with this division. But now, what's the problem? What's the problem for Searle's position? Uh, I think that uh, Searle's account, and this account <coughs> of uh, C collective intentionality, might work if, if we apply them to the games of pure coordination. For example, famous example uh, is from Thomas Shell. He says in experiments you can do uh, how, uh, no matter how many experiments you will do. If you have a si very simple game that you have, for example, $100 and it is said to people that they will get uh, half of that money only in the case that they will ask for same, per for same percentage of that sum. Otherwise, they will get nothing. It is, I mean, uh, people always uh, just split evenly. They, 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 they both, and, and of course, the decisions are uh, uh, disconnected. They, they, they decide separately. So we are very good in doing that kind of things. So what I'm saying now, uh, let's say that we have a game that we have uh, uh, to, to anticipate, we could have two possibilities. We could have each of us could get three units of something, or each of us in that game can get one unit of something. So now, of course, if we are <laughs> rational, we will anticipate that each of us would prefer to have three units of something, so that's how the thing works with this 50-50%. Uh, and now, what, I'm want, what I want, want to claim is that, okay, source conception, C collective intentionality thesis works for the uh, games of uh, pure coordination. Let's say that it's okay. But now, uh, the real challenge is to show that the same account works in games with mixed motives, actually, where we have incentives both for cooperation and for defection. Actually, we have conflicts of interest. Classical game in that sense is pris uh, Prisoner's Dilemma. So, it is, as it is well known in this game, each player has uh, two possible strategies, to cooperate and to defect. Uh, and it is obvious that defection uh, is the dominant strategy for each player because it's best response no matter what the other player is doing. Best thing is if the other player is, co uh, is cooperating and you're not cooperating. But in, in any other example, your best response is not to cooperate. But then what happens in uh, Prisoner's Dilemma is that 
what we get when we both don't cooperate is much worse than if we decide that we both cooperate. So actually, <coughs> what is individually rational for each player is, we might say, collectively irrational. And Derek Parfit uh, uh, says about this result of, of, of uh, pr prisoner's dilemma uh, example that actually if we, if we could choose some collective code that we all would follow, we would, <laughs> our prudence would uh, advise us to reject prudence or, or, or it would be in our self-interest not to <laughs> be self-interested. Okay, so, so my point is that uh, uh, this kind of collective intentionality grounds for cooperation, uh, in a sense, uh, Sir has in mind, uh, could sometimes, even in these cases, could sometimes <coughs> explain why people are cooperating in prisoners land. Okay, but it is also true that there are some alternative explanations, uh, of course, explanations uh, from, from uh, evolutionary game theory that both that, that, uh, 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 stick to the assumptions of rationality, methodological individualism, and I think better account for this whole story about cooperation. In order to, to skip this whole body of literature, I will just quote how it works in, in this evolutionary story, a quote from uh, Ken Binmore. Reciprocal altruism and, and the solution, and the solution from the perspective of evolutionary game theory is simply this. If we play prisoner's dilemma just once, then either we, if uh, actors are rational, they will not cooperate. If they cooperate, they're irrational. So <laughs> there's no third possibility. So, but then uh, uh, evolutionary game theory, uh, from evolutionary game theory, we also see, okay, it is just like that. But that is only the case if we play that game only once. If we repeat that game, it might be in the interest uh, of, of rational players to cooperate in prisoners' land. And here's the explanation. Esprical altruism cannot work unless people inter interact repeatedly without a definite end their relationship in sight. If the reason I scratch your back today is that I expect you will then scratch my back tomorrow, then our cooperative arrangement will unravel if we uh, know that we will eventually, that, that there will eventually be no tomorrow. The simplest kind of game in which re reciprocity can appear is therefore a repeated game with an indefinite uh, time horizon. The simplest of four theorems characterizes all equilibria of such a game in the case when nobody can conceal any information and everybody always cares about tomorrow nearly as much as they care about today. The important point is that any efficient outcome of original game in which players might like to agree approximates an equilibrium outcome of the repeated game. For example, a pretty efficient outcome in one, in one shot prisoner's dilemma is untenable because the only Nash equilibrium, Nash equilibrium is when we all give our best answers to, 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 to strategies or uh, all other people. Uh, in the game requires that both players defect, but if the prisoner's dilemma is repeated indefinitely often, the fault theorem says that cooperation can be sustained as a self-policing social contract. In equilibrium, neither, neither player will try to improve their lot by cheating on the cooperative social contract today because they, they see that the other player will respond by nullifying today's game in the future. So, having in mind this alternative uh, explanation of, of uh, how we could get to the equilibrium of individual strategies in Prisoner's Dilemma, I think that Sir would have to, to, to uh, uh, show us an argument uh, that would explain social cooperation not, uh, cooperation, not just from the perspective of intentionality, but also from the perspective of rationality. Because we have that kind uh, of explanation, just uh, relying on the assumption of rationality. I end 
uh, this part of my presentation by claiming that actually uh, what I show is that this uh, uh, what I call C collective intentionality is false because it is not necessary to have collective intentionality in order to have social cooperation. Okay, that's it for the first, first part. Now, uh, recall that certain things of institutional reality is constituted by collective intentionality. That is what I call a collective intentionality thesis. In order to have institutional reality, certain rules, namely constitutive rules, have to be collectively accepted or recognized. Furthermore, social stat status functions are created exactly by coll collective imposition of constitutive rules on some objects, persons, or freestanding terms such as corporations. But if this is the structure of institutional reality, how it really functions? So thinks there must be some connection between institutional reality and individual rationality, if it has to function at all. On that point, I'm in agreement with Sir. Where I disagree is the explanation of this connection. Actually, Sir's own, own conception of rationality is the main source of the problem, or so I shall argue. It is strange that in a volume of more than 300 pages discussing the concept of rationality in his book Rationality in Action from 2001, Sir then provide a clear definition of what he, what he means by rationality. The most explicit formulation one can find in pages uh, 2010 and 2011 where he says the features of rationality involve the capacity to operate in various ways with reasons for action. Okay, now usually mean by that conception that certain pair of belief and desire is reason for action, that reason causes an action, and that reason causes an action in the right way, which means the absence of deviant causal chains. Sir calls this view the classical model, but I prefer to call it the standard model of rational explanation. It is usually called like that. And Sir strongly opposes this view. So we have to be careful when we speak of Searle's view of reasons for action. What I'm going to do now is first to present Searle's non-standard view on reasons of, for action, and then to show how it is erroneous in several respects. For Searle, reasons are effective entities, or simply facts, although, uh, uh, or simply factatives. Although this term uh, suggests that reasons are facts, which is widely shared view today, for example, Parfit, Scanlon, Dancy, and so on, on Searle's view, facts are only one of the many factors. Other factors also include desires, beliefs, obligations, and so on. So, what might be factor? Let's say that uh, it is raining outside. <coughs> the reason for me take, uh, for taking an umbrella might be that I have a desire to stay wet. The reason is, might be my belief that it is raining outside. The reason might be fact that it is raining. Reason is to be strange, but he also said maybe we have obligation to, <laughs> to go out with an umbrella. Strange obligation, but it could happen. So, according to Sir, these are all examples of factatives. So, what is common feature of all factatives is that they are <coughs> positionally structured entities. Here, Sir is still in agreement with classical model that also presupposes propositional content of beliefs and desires. What might be new is his proposal that reasons for action should include facts and obligations, but I think that is also compatible with the classical model. For example, uh, remember, for example, uh, what Davidson says about pro attitudes, that they could also include uh, uh, obligations, or what Williams says about motivational set that could also include dispositions for evaluation, obligations, and so on and so on. So, in order to sort out the fact that it certainly makes the difference between internal and external reasons. This is the very same difference that Williams introduced in his seminal paper. There he argues for two things. First, that there are no external reasons in the sense that they cannot motivate someone's action. To have reasons for action simply means that your motivational set S is not empty. Second, Williams claimed motivating reason can be also normative. If the conclusion uh, about what to do that starts from the premise in which is expressed our desire or some member of the motivational set goes via uh, sound deliberative route. This usually means that the person is capable of practical reason. Now, Searle thinks that uh, Williams is mistaken in holding that there are no external reasons. 
He says that external reason is factitive entity in the world that can be reason for an agent, even if he does not know that entity or knows of it, but, it, but refuses to acknowledge it as a reason. That much would also internalists accept. What he or she does not accept is that external reasons can be motivating or that they can explain rational behavior. I said, here is for on this word, rational, not just behavior. I will call this position, which accepts both internal and external reasons, uh, subjectivism. So the main problem for subjectivists, and I think that so is kind of subjectivist, is to show how external reasons can be motivated. That, that's the problem. Uh, Searle defends his own form of subjectivism by introducing the concept of total reason. He defines the total reason as a set of factitive entities. Recall that factitive entities include re internal reasons such as belief desires, but also external reasons such as facts in the world or fact that someone is under application. Applications actually are Searle's favorite example of external reasons for action. Searle's commitment to subjectivism is clearly expressed in his view that external reasons must be internally represented or recognized as well as in his claim that total reason must contain at least one motivator. Although I find subjectivism an attractive position, I argue against Searle's form of subjectivism concerning reasons for action. Instead of just internal representation or recognition of, of external reasons, internalists claim that there must be some deliberative root from some member of motivational set certain action, and instead of just postulating that there, there must be some motivator, maybe internal, maybe external, for Searle, uh, because for Searle, as he claims, both external and internal reasons can be motivators, internalists insist that it must be some desire or pro attitude. From my point of view, the subjectivists should go from both internalist points on that matter. Of course, Searle doesn't accept any of them, and that's uh, actually a source of the problem. So, and I will, uh, uh, I will go to the conclusion of this part. Actually, I present what, what, what is here, his argument here. Uh, he is arguing for two things in this story about uh, reasons for action and connection with institutional reality. First, he is arguing that there could be some kind of direct motivation via uh, recognition of rationality. And his second argument that there could be some indirect uh, uh, motivation via uh, uh, desire-independent reason and then that, that, that uh, causally affects desire, and then we have desire that... that uh, I think that uh, both of his arguments uh, are not well taken. Uh, why? Uh, take first recognition of rationality. As I said, what is characteristic for rationality is this sound deliberative route from you. We have uh, certain desires, we have certain beliefs, from which we, we derive conclusion uh, what to do, how to act. Okay, now what Searle says about recognition of rationality. He says, okay, there is some external fact. If it has to motivate our behavior, it's just enough to recognize it. Okay, I have some obligation. Okay, and I said, okay, maybe, maybe we can explain uh, certain behavior. But what I'm claiming is also that if we have no deliberation, and so is explicit that we have no deliberation, we just recognize the fact that we have obligation, then uh, the problem is that, that it is very close to, uh, to uh, famous Wittgenstein saying that we follow the rules blindly. So my question is, okay, we might explain behavior in that way, but where's the rationality? And, and actually, Sir gives us uh, a following example. He says, uh, let's say that you go to the restaurant or bar and order beer. And now, he said, when I look to my motivational set, I don't find anything that will motivate me to pay <laughs> for that beer. So, internal misconception must be false. So, but then, what's the reason for my paying uh, the bill? Yeah, he said, simply, 
It's a fact. <laughs> when I order beer, I already, uh, I, I already have obligation to, 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 to pay the bill, and that's the reason. But I, I, I shall not quote it here. He said, and that is important, he says, and that is a reason. But my question is, but is it a reason for action? That's the problem. Yeah, we can recognize it as a reason, but still, that reason might not motivate me. And I think that is obvious because we could have, uh, we could recognize different kind of obligations. But for example, because of the weakness of will or, or uh, so, uh, some other explanation, we simply <laughs> that obligations will not be carried out. So I think that uh, uh, this story about recognition of reality, and I also think that the whole story about recognition of reality is underdescribed. So never gives his account what is recognition of rationality. We know for bounded rationality, that's a form of, I, I understand it in that way. <coughs> it's something that we don't always uh, search for the best thing to do, but what, sat what is satisfying. So in this case, we don't have to uh, include whole machinery of reasoning and so on, where in a situation of bar, we just, <laughs> it could be explained in a sense as a rational behavior, but in this, uh, sense of boundary rationality, but Cyril doesn't explain that in that way, so, so I think that's a problem. I think that he was also aware that, uh, that uh, recognition of rationality is not enough to, to explain our motivation uh, for a certain behavior, so <laughs> then uh, he plays his wild card and say, okay, now we, we will introduce desire independent reasons for action. So now we will try to figure out where is the real motivation. And uh, I will just uh, uh, have another quotation uh, from uh, Making the Social World, just to show you how these things work. And I, 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 I don't have time to go into the whole story about desire and independent reasons. But in a sense, that is the same story as <laughs> external reasons. We have the same problem here. So he said, so we, uh, he see, and he clearly, that what I see as a problem, he, he clearly says, okay, this is a par some kind of paradox. And uh, this from page 129, where he says, so we can now restate the paradox and the resolution of paradox. The paradox is that there can be desired independent reasons of action, but at the same time, every action must be expression of desire to perform that action. Well, we agree, something <laughs> missing here. Okay. And now, what Searle says, the resolution of the paradox is that the recognition of desire independent reason, this is recognition of this recognition of rationality, can ground desire and thus cause the desire, even though it is not logically in in, uh, invented, in inevitable that they do and not empirically universal that they do. But then, <laughs> if it is true what he says, then I actually would say, okay, that what Searle says, it is a solution. For me, it is a real paradox. It might be called, or I call it, <coughs> paradox of that desire independence. For, for <laughs> we just presuppose, we, if we say, and so repeated uh, many pages, okay, desire is not uh, ground for a reason, but reason is ground for a desire. I mean, I, I, I still don't see a real connection. This causal connection that Searle says that exists between uh, recognition and, and, and desire, I simply don't see that connection. Okay, and so I will stop here. I will I have a few more examples, maybe maybe we we'll use it in discussion. I will stop here. What I was arguing in this second part of my lecture, it was not against uh, the uh, a collective intention the a collective nationality thesis as such. I I didn't argue for or against that thesis. I don't even didn't uh, I, I uh, even didn't uh, express my opinion whether I think it is 
valid or not. What I was arguing is the following thing, that if we accept that thesis, and if we accept, as Searle says, that there must be some connection via rational behavior, then that connection must be uh, somehow demonstrated. In my view, in my opinion, Sir didn't uh, demonstrate that connection, and I think that the burden of proof is on those who are claiming that it is possible. So thank you very much.